There we go. Okay. Ah. Great. <laughs> So well, let me just introduce Kit. My name is Terry. My company is called Reveal Marketing. And Kit is my aunt. She lives in Oregon. And I noticed- Actually, I live in uh, Mission Viejo. That's right, California. you live in California. That's right. How far is it from where everybody else is in Oregon? Oh, I don't know how many hundreds of miles, but you know, they're up, it's a whole state. It's a long, a long way. I'm at the oh. bottom of California. Not, oh, you know, really I'm in Orange County. So I'm like in LA, greater LA. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, and, and what I noticed was that Kit has a really amazing social media presence and I was really curious about this. I was like, I'm going to get in on this and see what's going on. Um, but I also love to brainstorm with companies and with people that, that have a business and entrepreneurs online. I think it's really fun to, um, to just be, uh, just bounce ideas off. And so I thought it'd be really fun to, to do that with Kit today. So Kit, do you want, do you have a, like a 30 second that you like to do and just to introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Um, hi, I'm Kit O'Malley. I blog, I actually started getting into social media as a blogger. Um, when, um, Terry, when, um, uh, Marcos is your husband's great grandfather. Is that great grandfather? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, grandfather, grandfather. I'm like, there's so many. We have so many generations alive in 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 that clan. Um, his grandfather Chuck yeah. had um, a sepsis and a stroke in the hospital up in Canada while he was traveling. I was so stressed that um, I became. Uh, hypomanic and had to do something with it like um because it just it just uh, it hit me deeply that somebody i loved was you know near death and my husband was up there um with the family with his uh father um what's amazing is lots of lots of i had because i got i got on social media all of a sudden i got all these prayers there was like tons of prayers because they're putting out prayer requests and there was just tons of prayers going out for his for him which was i think helped a great deal but I started to write because I needed a way to um, express what was going on and um, um, when I said hypomanic I'm I have I live with bipolar type 2 mm -hmm. um, which is a, a chronic mental illness and requires medication and therapy and stuff like that so and one of the things that happens when I become overwhelmed is I sometimes become either hypomanic or depressed depending you know what's going on so this time you know in spite of taking medications and being very you know proactive with my mental health um, you know I still have a chronic illness so my way of one way of coping was to write and in writing I um, became involved with the mental health um, online mental health advocacy community um, and um, and started to develop a, a social media following, a following of my blog. Um, I started to promote my blog on a variety of social media outlets. And um, and now I'm taking what I've written in my blog and repurposing it as a book and memoir. Oh, that's so that's it in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. All right, so I have some questions based on what you said. And then also, I, you know, I had had just started creating a list of questions for you. So we'll just get going. Okay, great. And let's see. I did want to ask, so when you started your blog, when did it transition just from a means of writing to I can potentially benefit other people? How long before you realized that? It could be beneficial just for people that have bipolar and people that have, you know, you know, mental illness that they want some support. They want to read something. Right. Well, I've always been an open person and I've always and I had um, I was a former psychotherapist back in my 30s. So you have to understand that I started writing um, when I was about 50. So I had already had a background in sharing my story and in being open about it in, because um, I'm somebody who appears, quote unquote, appears normal. Like people don't understand that mental illness isn't something that shows on the outside. And many, you know, not everybody with mental illness um, 
is uh, there are higher functioning, there, it, it's on a spectrum. So some of us um, can hide it, um, even though it's very much something we struggle with. Um, and But I never hid it verbally. I always shared it with people because it, it just in showing them that somebody who they can identify with um, has a mental illness, um, broke some stigmas and also um, helped them to say, often people would say, oh, really? My, you know, and they, almost everybody has a, somebody they love okay. who struggled with something, whether it be depression or, I mean, it's very common. So they were able to share their story. So I, it's kind of my, I've always been that way. So I don't know that there was ever a transition. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Okay. That's cool. All right. And so what about then when you noticed that the technology was going in the direction that you would be able to share? Is that more of how what happened? You were just like, oh, wow, this is a place where I can share. Um, well, what's interesting is that I, back in the 90s, I developed corporate websites. Um, not as my primary job, but I would work for, uh, when I quit, when I burned out or had my breakdown at 30, um, I was a psychotherapist working with severely emotionally disturbed adolescents. And I had a breakdown and I ended up just in my recovery, just taking a temp job. Um, and the temp job turned into a 10 year career in commercial real estate. And working in that career, um, I, um, would i'm just a problem solver by nature so i'd go in and i'd say you don't have a website you need a website i'm not a graphic designer but i can get you i can figure out how to create a website for you that is clean looking wow. um so as soon as i registered my first url i i in my mind i had kidomalley.com like i knew okay. one day i would create a website kidomalley.com and on it i would put my writing so i already knew that like 20 years before I, you know, almost, I mean, I don't know the exact years, so my math's a little bit fuzzy here, but yeah, 20 years before I knew that I would eventually have a website and I would put my writing on it. I didn't know it would be a blog, mm -hmm. um, but I knew what websites were and I knew you could post writing on websites. Okay, that's very cool. Okay, and I wanted to ask, so when were you officially diagnosed with mental illness? Well, when I was 18, I was um, suicidal um, as a freshman at UCLA. Um, I never attempted it, but I had, at one point, I had the means, a plan, um, like I gathered all the pills together in my dorm room. I had a plan for what time I'd written a note, and all of a sudden, I like got outside myself, like I observed what I was doing, and I was like, oh my, oh my goodness, I'm actually going to do this. Wow. This is, it's not just ideation, I actually. So I um, sought help. Um, I had friends who, when I had had just ideation and expressed it to them in the past, had insisted I get help. And I had gone and wasn't helped by the psychotherapist I saw that time at UCLA. So the second time, um, I had a dear friend from high school who was going to UCLA to come and just hang out with me um, because I didn't feel safe by myself. And I went to my resident assistant, the RA um, in the dorms. And I said, I need to see like a really good psychologist now, like today, you know, this is, and um, I saw a cognitive behavioral therapist at UCLA or psycho psychologist at UCLA. And he helped me kind of rewrite some of the negative scripts that go on in the head of somebody with depression. Um, and so I had struggled with depression um, no, you know, with, with psychotherapy until I was 30. And then when I was 30, I turned also to medication, like seeing a psychiatrist. Oh, first in my doctor, just regular, you know, internist, and then a psychiatrist. Um, and I still was diagnosed with depression, dysthymia, which is chronic depression. Um, I had a reaction to medication and I did have a, a week of mania at 30 but they weren't sure if it was at that time they just thought it was a reaction to the medication so they kind of changed my medications and I was stabilized so I lived with that diagnosis of depression until um, we had our son and our son was 
a toddler, but I was still breastfeeding him. And then I started having these euphoric feelings of um, being called by God to this or that. And, and then I recognized whether or not God was calling me to a, one church or another church. There weren't crazy things, actually, that I felt God was calling me to. They were very healthy and wonderful things. But I recognized that euphoria as being a symptom of mania or hypomania. And so I um, uh, called the advice nurse for our um, um, insurance. And she said, either see a psychiatrist today or go into an emergency room. Mm -hmm. And so I went into our regular doctor because I couldn't get in to see a psychiatrist right away. Um, and she, um, until I could get in to see a psychiatrist, she put me on a mood stabilizer. Um, we abruptly weaned our son, or I abruptly weaned our son with help of, and that's a great, I have a great story for that, actually, which I'd like to share. And that was, that's when I was diagnosed, um, when I saw a psychiatrist with bipolar type 2. Um, now, here's the weaning story, because that's, this is so sweet. Um, I, I was, not because I believed in extended um, uh, nursing, but just because I'm soft at heart. Um, our son was like 27 months and still sometimes nursing, not for his main food, but like for when he, when he, you know, just like to go to bed or, you know, stuff like that. And so, um, so he had never had mom not come home and we decided the way I, I would wean him because the medication I was going to take was not okay for nursing was for me to just spend the weekend at my parents' house and that my husband would spend the weekend. So it was drizzly rain and he, he had never had mama not come home and he didn't believe I wasn't going to just come back, like go grocery shopping and come back. So he insisted that he sit near the driveway with my husband to wait for me to come back. And so my husband, Nick, you know, your uncle Nick sat near the driveway with him. And then, and then he talked to me, he's like, Oh, it's drizzling rain. Why don't we just get underneath the, you know, the, the, the overhang. And like, okay, let's just get up into the door jam. Now, why don't we try waiting for mom going on the stairs? Because he's, you know, and then and then up the stairs. And then in the master bedroom, but still looking at the front door until he finally fell asleep. It's so Aww. sweet. My husband's so sweet, you know, that he did this. Anyway, I just think that's such a great story for how caring my husband was with my son. That is Our true. son. <laughs> dads, dads have their interesting agendas. That's how you love dads. My dad always had an agenda. <laughs> Marcos is like that too with the kids. He's got this funny agenda going, but then then they just do just really cool things. And even my dad now he loves hanging out with Marcos, and it's so cool to see them hanging out together. And I just not something that I would have imagined when I was you know ten or eleven years old. So so yeah, dads are are really special and important. And I was really curious how how do you maintain a relationship when you're going through something like that? I don't know. I've always been really self-conscious in relationships and so kudos to you that you've been, you know, you've you've held a you know, really strong relationship with your husband that whole time and but um I don't know that might even be its own webinar <laughs> with right you. right. It's so, um, go ahead. It's actually the divorce rate among people living with bipolar disorder is generally much higher than, you know, the general population. Um, and we've had our struggles. Um, you know, um, my husband is, uh, he's an engineer and I think of engineers as being kind of worst case scenario people because they have to always design for the worst so, yeah. so when we were first dating, he's like, you know, here I have, you know, this anxiety about things going wrong. And he's had a lot, he'd had a lot of losses of people. And here you have the history of depression. And I worried if I worry about losing you, and I'm like, it's never going to happen. That's not going to happen because I always get help. I'm very proactive with my mental health. I've always been. So yeah. it's, that's not going to happen. So, um, so there have been times when we, earlier on in our relationship where we kind of pushed each other's buttons in a way, but I think we have helped each other to um, learn and overcome our fears and help each other. So we're complementary. And um, honestly, although there have been in, in, a, in a marriage, there might even be years that are hard years 
you know, just because one or the other of you is going through a difficult time. Um, but it's so worth it to go through those years and not just to give up because I couldn't have made it. I don't think I could have made it without him. Uh, he's my rock and he, um, he's hugely supportive. Um, and I think I knew even, um, when I had my breakdown at 30 at, before that I lived by my, I mean, I lived with a boy, boy a couple of boyfriends in my twenties, but I lived most of the years of my twenties by myself. Um, and, um, I mean, I didn't meet my husband until I was just, just two weeks short of 31. Um, but I realized after my major breakdown at 30, that it wasn't safe for me to live by myself. I needed somebody to kind of observe my behavior. Um, because if it weren't for a friend calling my parents and saying, Kit's in trouble, she needs you now. And she also called the priest at the Episcopal church that I attended. And she said, Kit's in trouble, she needs help now. And I can't help her, it's beyond what I can do. Um, um, and I thank her for it. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> so I've lost touch with her, but she really, was a lifesaver. Um, I mean, my parent, my dad just got on an airplane and came up to me. I was living in the Bay Area at the time, San Francisco Bay Area. And, um, and my priest came right over. Um, and with uh, someone who had bipolar disorder, because that's what they saw I had, even though at that time I wasn't yet diagnosed it. And he's like, they weren't, you weren't diagnosed that? That was obviously what you had. But, <laughs> but they came over and they helped. Um, so um, I don't know if that was, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, okay. I wanted to go back a little bit to, you said you, you had mentioned an advocacy group. Is that right? Like mental health advocacy? Yeah, that's kind of a term we use, those of us who, um, uh, who, mostly live with mental health issues or have family members who live with mental health issues and are um, active in um, speaking out. We okay. tend, the term mental health advocates are, is the term we call ourselves because we ad are advocating for mental health. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's not a group per se. Okay. They're, they're, um, it's more a, a title. Okay, that's good, okay. Because I was curious, I wanted to, you know, one thing that I noticed as I was looking at all your profiles was just, I mean, it looked to me like you probably have been on Twitter the longest. Oh, really? Because you have a lot, you have a lot of followers on Twitter. <laughs> you know, it's not because I've been on there of the longest. It's because um, I actively uh, sought to develop those, um, to grow that at one time. And then once you start it, it kind of just grows on its own. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, that, I noticed too that you have almost as many, you're following on almost as many people as are following you, which generally I find that there's like a, about a 50%, you know, it's like you're, if you're following a thousand, then you usually have about 500 followers. So usually it's about half, but with you, I noticed that it was almost the same. And I was like, well, that means that she did a lot of hard work because that means you had to go in and like that. And a lot of people were like, well, I'm too busy. I can't do that. I'm just, you know, once I hit 5,000, I was too busy to do it. So, um, so that was really cool to see that you had kept that up and, you know, you kept doing that. And, um, but so what were you on first then? If you were Honestly, I don't know. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna guess that I was on um, Facebook just as a regular person being on Facebook, not you know just as Kit Kit being on Facebook to connect with um, family members and stuff. Okay. So that would have been before the blog. Um, the stuff in terms of Twitter and Google Plus and LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff probably. Um, I mean, I'm just going on my memory, but probably as I went through, um, I did a WordPress, um, you know, the blogging 101 course. Now they call it, now they call it blogging university. You can go to WordPress and just put in blogging university mm -hmm. and, um, and take 
their, uh, you know, online how to do this. And they kind of by step by step recommend, you know, how to build a following and how to build a social media presence. And then also I just in talk, I, I was active. I'm still active, but not as much in person, but I was um, uh, going to writers groups. Mm -hmm. And um, in my writers groups, published authors would come and speak sometimes and say how important it was to have a social media presence on a variety of platforms to um, develop your author platform, even before you publish a book, um, because you should have a, you know, um, not just an odd, not just necessarily an audience, but so, you know, support um, or, you know, an author platform. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to have, you have to have some exposure. So, because, you know, that's, you do the, the work before you have it, it uh, the book done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there and is. And you continue lot. after, but it, yeah, it's like, she's lot. like three years before you publish a book, you should start building your platforms. Yeah, wow. And I bet most people don't do that. But there's a lot of pre-work. And I, I have had a couple of clients that, wanted to do a particular kind of campaign and i thought yeah but your website it has to be so good if you do that like just i mean even getting any kind of pr because you know people are going to go straight back and get on their website you know, right so if that's not ready don't get pr yet <laughs> you know don't don't get a big newspaper article or something and then your website isn't even done you know don't, right. don't so yeah, it does. It takes time. You really should have all of that stuff ready. What do you, so talk about how it, how having a mental illness has affected your work or maybe, I don't know, how they work on each other like that is, do you have any um, well, I think that, um, I know as both a psychotherapist, I'm trying to act now, now look at the camera because I keep on looking at you. So I, I don't know if it's okay that I look at you rather than the camera, but whatever, I'm going to look at you. <laughs> that's yeah, that's good. Um, I think that the, um, well, first of all, it's therapeutic to write. Okay. That's so good. it might not be in everybody's best interest to write as openly as I do. Um, you know, and some people write anonymously or write on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, it's, it, it, I know it's therapeutic to write for everybody. Okay. Um, so I write openly just because my personality has always been an open one my whole life. And I've always believed that if I put it out there, that, um, it, it couldn't hurt me because I'm in control of it. I'm in control of the information. No, um, I know that my sister, for example, and uh, sorry that I'm bringing up my, I hope she's okay with me saying this, but she was concerned by some of the stuff I was putting out there that it would have negative consequences, you know, like what if people are going to think, you know, because I, I disclose things, you know, mistakes I had made in parenting, for example, you know, just, I'm a, I'm a good parent, but you know, I've made mistakes. And she said, what if, uh, you know, what if this, um, you know, what if somebody sees this, sees that piece of writing and thinks that you're an unfit mother or whatever, you know what I mean? And I said, no, that's not going to happen because I go to therapy. I go to a psychiatrist. I'm so proactive. And, you know, anybody who come to, I, I know, and I already know what that, I mean, I've already worked as a psychotherapist with abused children. So I know that's not the situation here. <laughs> So I had one time when I smacked my kid because he called me a name, which was not okay. And I wrote about it because I think it's important that we, you know, deal with the, the issue of child abuse and with how untreated mental illness or even mental illness that's treated, but, you know, still symptomatic or just parenting in itself. I mean, you know, what parent hasn't wanted to smack their kid when their kid's gotten, you know, called you a name. <laughs> I'm not saying it's okay, but it happens. And I think it's important that, that more important that we own it and try to address it than pretend it never happened and hide. So somebody who acknowledges they did, they made a mistake and tried to not make that mistake again, you know, is, I, I never was worried about that, but I've worked in that industry. So I know, you know, I mean, I've made child abuse reports, so I know what constitutes child abuse and what doesn't constitute child abuse. 
How, so what you so where did you go to college then? Well, undergraduate, I started out at UCLA as a, a biochem major because I wanted to be a doctor. My whole life, my parent, my parents um, it said, "Oh, Kit, she's going to be a doctor." I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I wanted to fix brains. So it's kind of interesting that I'm doing this because I'm still in the brain industry. And then, but I was suicidal and I ended up quitting after my freshman year um, and took a semester off and then went to community college for um, a year part time. Um, and then I transferred up to Berkeley and I kind of was like, oh, if you're not going to be a doctor, then I guess you're going to be a lawyer. So I was a legal studies major, which was a great major because it was interdisciplinary and it was very intellectually stimulating and I loved it and Berkeley was just a better fit for me. Uh, I was a rabble rouser and kind of politically act, political activist and stuff and then so as that kind of I'm kind of I kind of fit in there. Um, and then um, for grad school, I never really. I, I then I became a legal assistant just to see if I wanted to be a lawyer and I decided no, I don't want to be a lawyer. These hours are too crazy and I was a workaholic legal assistant. And so I um, took time off and, um, you know, I quit that. I had saved money because I worked so many hour time, overtime hours. And I just thought, let me just take some time off. I have enough to save to just kind of chill a bit. I was young, single. And um, I just sort of synchronistically, someone, um, uh, I went to a, a law school lecture just because I was, had you know and uh the dean came up and he said are you interested in coming to law school because i you know interacted um uh you know to, in the discussion and i said no no and then the dean of their psychology program this was new college of california which doesn't exist anymore it's not like uc berkeley it's you know not sorry it's not prestigious <laughs> But it was a good school for a psychodynamic education. But anyway, so I said, no, I don't want to go to law school. And then the, the, the recruiter for their psychology program said, are you interested in a socially conscious psychology program? And I was like, oh, tell me more. Because the progressive political me, and I'm like, oh, well, okay, I've never taken a psychology course, but tell me about this program. And so I applied for the program, and um, and at the same time, I had a canvasser come raising money for a battered woman shelter, and um, I didn't have them, you know, I couldn't spare the money because I was living off savings, so I said, um, no, but do they need volunteers? So I ended up volunteering for the battered woman shelter and then becoming an administrator there. So I was an administrator at battered woman shelter and going to grad school at New College of California at the same time. I ended up becoming a psychotherapist, um, working in the Bay Area, with the severely uh, pregnant and parenting teens and severely emotionally disturbed kids um, until I had that breakdown. And then I started a career in commercial real estate just from a temp job and had a decade long career in commercial real estate doing sort of administrative marketing and analysis. Um, and then, um, okay, and then, and then I had a breakdown when I was a mom when my son was four, um, cause I was working crazy hours, like until 2 AM as a mom, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, so yeah. it's like that it's long hours and weird hours. Yeah. I was working for, yeah, I was working really crazy, crazy hours. So I, um, ended up, uh, hold on. I'm going to get my, Ooh. Just gonna fall off. There we go. Oh, hi, kitty. I ended up going to going hospitalized, and after I and then partially hospitalized, um, and then after that, I went to seminary actually. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, for and I went to Fuller Theological Seminary, which is a great seminary. Wow. A couple of times, but I didn't finish because my we had moves, and every time we'd move even though I could continue to study, whether it be distant study or at a different campus, um, mm -hmm. the move would trigger depression and it took like a full year for me to recover each time. So um, I never finished any seminary training, but, um, but I, I did go. Okay. <laughs> and in the seminary training though, I developed a mental health ministry uh -huh. handbook which is on my website, actually. I, I kind of amended it to be non-Christian and non denom you know, like any, for any faith. Okay. Um, and I kind of realized that I had, uh, that God was calling me to a mental health ministry. 
So okay. I don't go. So that's kind of what I what I can. I mean, it's not necessarily a Christian ministry. <laughs> It's not necessarily a Christian ministry, but it's a, um, I believe that, not that I'm special in any way, but I kind of have reframed what's gone on with me in a way to make it meaningful and purposeful. Um, you know, that, um, that I tried to work, but was a workaholic, um, and that basically God made me stay home by making it so that I couldn't work and I have a high needs kid and he kind of made it so I had to stay home and take care of my kid so after and that the, so since then you haven't had a like a traditional full-time role since then how that? since I was hospitalized I've been on disability oh, okay even okay. going on a job interview recently um not recently but I tried going on a job interview when my son was in a freshman in high school. Mm -hmm. I think that was the time. I'd have to go back to my blog and see when. And I started I started becoming hypomanic just going on the interviews. Oh wow! So just the social 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 interaction and social stimulation triggers me. And I used to before I was a mom, it was just sort of like, okay, so I'm a workaholic. I'm super productive. I didn't really recognize it as symptomatic. I just look like a high achiever. Yeah. But when you're a mom, you can't work until 2 a.m. <laughs> and all of a sudden I like realized, okay, that's not, I didn't, it took, it took a breakdown for me to realize, okay, that's symptomatic. That's not healthy. That's not, you know, that's not okay. Um, so, um, I mean, I wasn't the only person there, <laughs> but still. Yeah. Define breakdown. Okay, well, um, I guess the other way, uh, when I was 30, it was a, what I experienced was I was on antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants, and I ramped up to, on those antidepressants, a week in which I couldn't sleep and in which I was thinking simultaneously in binary, which is zeros and ones, about chaos theory, which is physics, and about um, Christian mystics, which was a particular interest of mine. Um, but the thoughts were just racing through my mind. That's mania. I, mean, I couldn't even co comprehend the thoughts they were racing through my mind so quickly. And there's no way I can comprehend zeros and ones. I'm not a computer. So I didn't even know if it made sense. But I had some understanding of each of those three things. You know, I mean, I understand, understood what they were, and I found it interesting intellectually. I was kind of observing my thought process <laughs> like oh this is fascinating <laughs> too bad i can't record it and see if it actually makes sense yeah but that was my 30 year old breakdown okay and then when, when did you start when did you start the blog when i started the blog i was i think i was about 50 because it was like in 2013 okay yeah well, i'm 54 long. now so i, I guess Okay, so about fifty. Okay, and 2013, then yeah. were you thinking that there would be a book that long ago, or was that later? That I've always kind of, um, yeah, I thought that I could um, develop a book by writing. Yes. And how much? You have a lot of. You know, I noticed you have a lot of followers. Do a lot of those people reach out to you? Do you communicate? Um, well. As a blogger, I um, you can choose to allow commenting or not, but I interact with comments, and so I have a lot of commenters. So yes, I have that. I don't. I had my contact page up once, but for some reason, I just feel it feels intru intrusive to have emails come to me. I don't know why. It just I don't like a whole bunch of people emailing me directly, and for them, then down my email when I respond. So I prefer to. And I also don't even, I don't like direct messaging people either. I prefer everything to be out in the open. Um, so, yes. so um, because I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm protecting my own boundaries that way. Um, especially when it's a man, you know, and uh, okay. men often get really inappropriate or talk about, oh, you're beautiful or whatever. And I'm married. So, you know, it's just, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. If I keep it public, then I'm, I'm sort of protecting my boundaries, but it's harder, you know, some people aren't able to then 
share their story unless they come on as in an anonymous way, which they can do on the blog. You know, they can, they don't have to share their actual name. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I've had people both through my various social media presences and on the blog reach out and I've had a lot of um, interaction with people and, um, and you could say I even counsel people, but I don't, I don't, I do have my, I've maintained my license. So I actually am a California licensed marriage and family therapist, but I do not um, consider what I do part of that practice and I don't charge money for it. And I don't want to get into all that right now. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do, I don't want that. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? I, I, I just, I can't do that. It's just too much. And you never set out to do this for a living. It was just something fun that you wanted to do. It was never a, like, oh, I could do this for a job instead of having a traditional job. It was um, no, because I knew it wasn't really um, realistic to make enough money to do it. Um, uh, very few people who do creative writing make a living doing it. Um, I have tried doing some affiliate marketing and having ads on my website and it wasn't enough money okay. to make it worth it. It was like laughably small amounts. Yeah. And, and so I decided not to do it. And also I don't want to dilute my brand. Mm -hmm. So, um, my brand is being a mental health advocate and I don't really, um, I want it to just be me. So I want to be completely in control of the content that's on my site. The only thing I've really agreed to recently is a link to, um, my, and people ask, ask me all the time to add them to my resources page. And I don't, I don't do marketing for other people. So no, I'm not going to add for free a link to my resources page. It pisses me off. Okay. Even if, so, cause usually it's a veiled, like, uh, you know, somebody who's getting uh, paid for referrals or something to treatment okay. centers. Um, so, um, but I do have a link to uh, uh, clinical trials because I actually believe in science. <laughs> and uh, if, if it weren't for medication, I wouldn't be as well as I am. And if it weren't for advances in science, my mother would be dead. You know, she is alive thanks to monoclonal antibody therapy. And she was part of the th three clinical trials that developed that treatment for lymphoma. Um, it's a cancer treatment and um, that uh, has antibodies cloned that attack cancer cells. And so I'm a huge believer in re scientific research. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to my biochem self. <laughs> yeah. So what about the future then? Because what, what is the book? What is the book going to be called? I'm not sure what the book's going to be called, but I have a feeling it's just going to be something like Kid O'Malley, um, my, you know, my mental health blogging journey or something like that. You know what I mean? Because so much of my brand is myself. And I mean, I always see it that low. I mean, I created that logo, the dark green with the, the you know, Celtic font. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I mean, I didn't develop the font, but, uh, um, but all the kerning and everything is all me. <laughs> <laughs> size, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and that's, I mean, there were, that's kind of, I don't know, my branding, I guess. So I kind of see that kind of on the cover, even though I don't know if that's a good cover. <laughs> I see like that and me. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see. Okay. So, so your book, and you see that on your book cover. I see it even on my book cover. Yeah. Cause I don't necessarily want to write a bunch of books. You know, if I write others in the future, then it'll be something different, you know? So, um, I, I mean, what some, a couple of pieces I started doing towards, um, later writing was fictionalized, um, autobiography of my younger life. Um, and there's also just my whole twenties, you know, I mean, I don't talk about like my relationships and I don't talk about, um, 
my childhood, I moved a lot. We lived overseas. We lived in Saudi Arabia for five years. It was like, I have a, like, we, you know, I've, so I could take any piece of my life and, and fictionalize it into something maybe as in a creative way. Um, but this memoirs, is just, uh, like memoirs that you have to fill in a little bit, like historic fiction kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. Cool. So what about when, so, so you had the blog and in your, I know you already said you're 55. So definitely not a millennial. You know, my, I hear about the millennials all the time. Oh my gosh. Why do, they always get so much attention. Like just leave the millennials alone. Um, but you have really embraced a lot of social media and, you know, it's one thing to have the blog, but it's another thing to understand the impact that being on Instagram can have and being on Twitter can have. When do you give me some background on how you decided to branch out in that direction and how that impacted your presence, your blog? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm 54, I think. I think. Okay. I'll be 55 in August. Okay. I was born in 63. So not that it really matters. Who cares? I'm in my mid 50s. I don't have any problem with being in my mid 50s. Um, I, you know, whatever. <laughs> I just don't like this neck. That's all. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, I actually always was into technology. You know, I, um, as a as a legal assistant, I was a, a database manager. Um, when I worked at the Battered Women's Shelter, I did their new first. The first newsletter they had under my executive director was created by a graphic artist, and the executive director didn't like it because she thought it was too slick and corporate. So she had me do the rest of the newsletters. So I did desktop publishing, you know, and I um, of the of all, all the kind of marketing collateral we used there um, as, as administrator. And then, and then when I um, worked in the for-profit world, um, I, you know, created websites and did email marketing and, and direct mail collateral um, and would, um, and created, you know, I already said created a website. So I was already, I already knew the importance of um, technology for marketing. Um, because I had done it professionally, um, and, um, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't a big leap. You embrace, you embrace the current technology. Um, I, I, uh, I'm kind of a geek, so that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm into that. I don't embrace it all. Like I'm definitely not a Snapchat person or, you know, a WhatsApp person. I mean, I'm, I definitely focus on, um, I focus mostly on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, I have presences in a lot of other places, but I don't really actively manage them. It's more like my, um, I post to them, you know, so um, if I post on my website, it might be published in different places so that, you know, it might get hit places where other you know like tumblr you know or or whatever um um or pinterest like i do have a pin you know i do have in fact i recently i didn't even know about the pinterest covers and my board 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 cover so i recently redesigned all my board covers so i have more of a brand presence there so i was like yay so, <laughs> so I do. but um but i don't you know uh i kind of just put stuff out there I don't like interact on those as much. I can only do so much. So, yeah. Well, one thing I noticed, and I I don't think that I saw it on yours. I have had a couple of people ask about how to get verified on Twitter, and what I noticed on Twitter was that you have to have probably ten thousand followers to be verified. If you don't have more than that, they're not they're they're not going to bother with you. They have they have too much to do. So with you having 20,000, you could probably, I'm pretty sure you could do that verification process. I tried twice to be really? verified. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> so. Cause I didn't, I would, I just thought that, you know, once you got up to about 20,000 that they wouldn't fight it, you know, like before that they're like, well, you don't have enough even to worry about it. But 
Um, but that's interesting. I can take a look and see what the qualifications are a little bit more. It's real, it's like, there's not a whole lot of information about it. It's just like, click this button to get verified and Twitter right. will get on with you. So apparently when you tried to do it, they came back and said, we're not gonna verify you? Yeah. That's weird, okay. Um, and then my other question that I was thinking about was, um, have you thought about having a Facebook group where people could interact and talk and share? Um. Or are you on one that you're that you help with in some way? Have you done? I anything? honestly, this is. <laughs> I'm I regularly leave Facebook groups. I'm a member of a many Facebook groups, but it's just too. Um, I'm kind of a little overextended as it is, mm -hmm. you know, and should spend more time writing and less time on social media. Honestly, so okay. I don't know that I would do a Facebook group unless it was like after I wrote my book mm -hmm. after it was published yeah. and I had a little bit more time maybe then yeah not that I'm really writing every day but I know I should be <laughs> so. Okay. so what how how long do you think before the book is ready well I have um a writer's conference in May I'm going to um, uh, um and I was hoping to have um oh you know a completed draft i mean i do have a draft now but it's it's a work i have a work in progress now there's mm -hmm. it's very kind of cut and paste it part of it mm -hmm. um and i that i need to rewrite um at least once but even if it's just in a really rough form i'll have that weekend to really work on it so i my goal is by the end of this year to have it ready for publication mm -hmm. So I guess that would be in 2019 to okay. publish it. And who do you think will be reading? Who do you think your it's, audience is going to be? I think the audience would be either people who live with bipolar or um, those who care for someone with bipolar. Um, although I do have a lot of friends who are and identify with people who are writers or poets. Um, and some of my writing and my posts are more writerly. Um, but um, I honestly don't care. <laughs> and what I mean by that is it's in and of itself a big accomplishment to write a book. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of bipolar memoirs out there. Um, oh. And I've read a lot of them and a lot of my friends have written them, you know, so I, I'm, I'm going to be in what I, and maybe it isn't a glutted market. Maybe it's just, I know a lot of people who've written those memoirs because that's who I hang out with online. Um, so I don't necessarily expect to have, to make a lot of money or to have a lot of readers. Um, but I want it to, I don't like, but when you write here, let me try to figure out how to write, say this. When you blog, your older writing gets lost even though it's still there it's sort of like you, people just see what's present and even though it's categorized and has tags and all that kind of stuff um and and even though i can go back and share stuff or re-blog re it which i probably should do more <laughs> it gets lost so in writing something that rather than it being reverse cron what I'm going to do is do a narrative introduction that sort of gives the history of my mental health journey as I kind of shared it with you from 18 to now briefly and then gives rather than reverse chronologically but chronologically selected blog posts um, I'm not going to post everything because some of the things were um, go in in that cut and paste of the narrative and some of the things were more mental health information rather than standalone pieces of writing so that rather than so that they'll go from day one of my blog journey to you know day whatever i decide to wherever i stop i guess i stopped at the end of the year you know in september in terms of my okay i had another question about that um i wanted to ask have you do you ever blog about 
the trends that are happening with the the violence and people who have disability have mental health issues and who are caught in these negative worlds you know and you know negative um what do you even call it like lifestyle that they end up shooting people and you know we, have you ever come um, on no this? it's actually a hot topic like a hot button topic um it's not a lifestyle definitely um there's two issues one is the issue of violence um period and that's an issue that crosses that it isn't just an issue for people who have mental illness or, or um but it's an issue like for everybody um you know i mean for culturally or or human in terms of humanity so i there, i guess there's three issues for me there's gun control which i'm an advocate for um, just because I think there should be screening, just like if you have to go through testing and screening and you know, for to drive a car, mm -hmm. <laughs> you should for a gun. And mm -hmm. if there are limitations in which kind of a car you can drive, I can't just get into a semi and start right, you know, uh, you know, and drive and drive it right, a rig, because I don't have that kind of a driver's license. I can't just get on a motorcycle because I don't have that kind of a driver's license. Yeah, that's Same true. Thing. Then there's the issue of untreated mental illness and lack of resources those there are people not everybody but it's a lie for us to say that um, mental illness cannot result in in violence i've been violent due to symptoms of my mental illness i've had very disturbing thoughts and impulses i've which i've controlled my violence has been like flipping over a table you know slapping my kid on occasion not which is okay but it's you know it wasn't shooting people and, and both times i'm like oh crap you know what if we still mm -hmm. then there's the issue of most you know people in the who are mental advocates always point out that most people who are mentally ill are victims of violence rather than perpetrators of violence that's true but which is true. Most most people with mental illness don't go shooting up schools. But those people who did shoot up the schools, should, they needed help. Mm -hmm. um, and how we help people and 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 one of the problems is we have a deinstitutionalization, and so that there are a lot of people who um, probably should be. And, and, and people are gonna get very upset, like there will be mental health advocates who get very upset at the idea of forced treatment because there have been abuses of people in the past. But some people need treatment and will refuse treatment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it's awesome that you, it's really amazing that you you saw it, you were able to step out of your your that thought process and look at what you were doing. and. I would say, I mean, those people don't have that that ability. That right. just is amazing. And well, I was curious if, because you had said you had depression and bipolar. Is it? I mean, is it possible that the bipolar made you able to do that? Because it. What, what's the definition? Like, the uh, no, the. Um it's more like my my mental illness developed over time or that i always had bipolar type 2 and the diagnostic criteria have changed um so both of those things are part are, are in 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 play there um bipolar type 2 which is has let me define it you you have periods of depression and mine tend to be very severe and with bipolar type 2 it tends to be very severe and then rather than going full-blown mania you usually have hypomania now that week I talked to you about that's full-blown mania but it was very much triggered by medication mismanagement um, so um, me medications in somebody who has a genetic predisposition to be bipolar um, antidepressants can trigger um bipolar disorder can trigger mania oh wow it can trigger but but at the time i had that there was not the diagnosis in dsm of bipolar type 2 there was just bipolar type 1 and bipolar mm -hmm. type 1 is with that severe mania and severe depression 
you know, um, going all the time. And I'd never, I'd only had that severe mania that in response to the medications. In the past, I had been, I'd had different experiences that could be experienced, described a different way. You know, I hadn't had the same type of thing. So, you know, when we were trying to do our, when the psychiatrist was trying to do differential diagnosis, it was just like, mm, we're going to treat you as depressed for now and see how it goes. Okay. But that's not what gave me insight. What gave me insight is, first of all, um, I'm less ill than some other people. Second of all, I'm, I um, sought treatment early and trained my brain in, um, to recognize symptoms. And there is a symptom of mental illness called, and I can never say this word right, but um, but since it's Anna, I can't, see, I can't even say the word, but it means lack of insight. And it's actually a symptom of mental illness. And it means, you know, that some people with mental illness do not know and cannot, you know, is that they have a mental illness and will deny that they have a mental illness. And it's a symptom of their mental illness. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to reach those people. But not everybody with mental illness has that. And some people, like even myself, like develop over time more and more of an understanding. You have to understand, I've been in therapy since I was 18, and I'm in my mid-50s. So that's a lot of treatment. <laughs> so. And I trained as a psychotherapist. So. Yeah, that's interesting, too, that you, you, you have both viewpoints on that. That's really interesting. But while you were going, while you were in school, you didn't know, but you, you did because you had had some, you know, your freshman year, you had some stuff going on. So. Right. I knew I was struggling with depression and I was in therapy when I was in grad school. So, yeah. Do you know about, have you looked into curcumin at all? What's it called? Curcumin. Curcumin. So like there's turmeric right? Turmeric is the, it's a, a spice, like an herb, for mm -hmm. mostly in like the Middle East parts of the world. And, um, but curcumin is a, um, it's, it's a concentrated part of, of turmeric. So if you're taking turmeric, curcumin, you're getting a more condensed um, part of the turmeric and it's, and it has so many health benefits. And one thing I, and I just read, I read a book about curcumin that it helps with depression and, yeah. and it, it will even work with depression medicine. It will not hurt you to take both. It'll actually be a little bit better result to take. Yeah, both. actually I am now that I, I just couldn't, I'm not a good, uh, I don't comprehend a lot or with my ears, I better, I'm more with it written. So when you said turmeric, I knew what you were, were talking about. Um, I don't take turmeric regularly. I mean, we have the pills that have that in it, that it's called like turmeric, but it also has the curcumin in it. And um, it is an anti-inflammatory and that helps, definitely yeah. helps. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't take it regularly. I'm, I, I take fish oil, which is good, but I don't take, I, I probably should take it. Like my pill cases are just jam packed but it wouldn't hurt to add that. <laughs> well, the doctor that I, and I just recently read this book, I might have it right here. And I, can show you. I just, while you're looking that up, I just want to point out to, if anybody's watching that you have to be careful and talk to your doctor before taking yeah. certain herbal supplements, because things like St. John's wort is an antidepressant. And if you take it, it can, and are taking medications, you can have interactions that are not good. So be careful. But turmeric is different. Turmeric is safe. Yeah, curcumin. And so this is um, AJ Gold, PhD. This is his book. This book. Yeah, and cool. I got this for free. They were. I was at a health food store. I didn't even have to pay for it. They just said you can have it. If you're going to read it, you should you should take it and read it. And he recommends definitely talking to your doctor. He even has little parts of the book where you could say just print off this one page and it's a great way to to tell your doctor about it and to talk to your doctor about it so are you going to come back up so yeah this is this is really nice and um i my sister is going through some stuff right now too 
and she's taking these medications that are in this book and it's supposed to be about a 63 percent um what is the word? A result, you know, that 60 some odd percent of people get better on those drugs, but that if you take it with the curcumin, they found it to be more like a 77 percent uh, re positive result from mm -hmm. it. So it's not going to hurt to take both. Right. And I guess the curcumin by itself was about the same as the drug by itself. <laughs> so, you know, so it's really good research. And I am, I love natural remedies. I don't know if. I'm great. I don't know. I guess I'm I'm probably very positive when it comes to that stuff. Probably like a sucker, but this is my end. This is my my take on that. I think that natural stuff, natural stuff, are chemicals just like any other. And so when people think that in taking nutritional supplements, they're getting away from big pharma. Well, you're just going back into big nutritional supplements. I mean, it's a big. It's a huge business. It's a huge unregulated business. So you really want to talk to your doctor about what you're taking. It can be helpful, but it can be hurtful. You know what I mean? So that is one that is, it, my understanding is it is very helpful, you know, but there are ones that are not or can interact with your medication. So you definitely always want when you're taking nutritional supplements to understand that those two are medications. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I take them seriously. They're chemicals. You know what I mean? And just because they're natural, because hemlock's natural, right? You know what I mean? Just because they're natural doesn't mean that they're necessarily good. Yeah. So they can be natural, right? <laughs> right. So you just want to, you just want to make sure your doctors are, are know how things interact, or talk to a pharmacist. They know a lot of how chemicals interact. Um, so. <laughs> All right. Well, are there, is there anything else that you definitely wanted to talk about in this video? Something that we haven't hit on that you thought you'd really like to talk about? No. Okay. Because hey, we're almost at the hour. Yeah, it's been about an hour and 10 minutes. Yep. So pretty good. And, um, and I, I could keep talking to you for a really long time. So. I know. I know. Questions. We but, could go offline and just keep on talking. <laughs> Yeah, we could do that. We could take off the recording and, and chat for a little while. And um, I'm really bad. I, I, I haven't been able to embrace FaceTime. And I see it in movies a lot where people are just on FaceTime with their significant other and they're talking. And I haven't really embraced it like that. It's kind of weird. I, I don't know why I haven't been able to just do everything FaceTime you know, everything face-to-face -face on a device or a monitor. People use their computers like that a lot. I rarely, I mean, I would say I never do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't really nice. either. And in fact, I know once I called my sister from my parents' place and she's like, don't ever do that. Please contact, text me first, contact me first so I can put on makeup. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons. I don't want people to see what I look like usually, you know what I mean? And um, my husband FaceTimes, uh, his parents all the time, you know, uh, because he likes to, you know, to see them and talk to them. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't use it often. And I think it's because I, I usually just don't even want people to see what I look like. And I'm not even, I don't even talk on the phone as much as he does. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, real, I'm on the computer all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think just that's the written, the written like, word. I'm more of a written word. Yeah. Well, let me, so I did want to go back a little bit because I remember you saying about your blog that things get lost and, and being it more of a online marketing, I want to say an advocate, you know, cause I, I encourage people to do all of that and an enthusiast. I think that's probably a way that I should put it that I, I don't want you to feel like that about it. You know, you say it gets lost and reblogging is great. Yes. You know, going back out and refreshing it is awesome. but you know, if you've got it built really well with those keywords, the right people are going to find it. And it's really weird that you said that it goes, that it, that it gets lost because I feel the exact opposite. I feel like if you're putting something out there, eventually somebody is going to see it and the right people are going to see it and it's going to build up. That's how I feel about it. Like everything that you've done in the past, 
is building up so that what you're doing right now is even more powerful. So keep, keep doing all of that. And I am, um, and I guess, you know, like one question would be, do you ever want, you don't ever want to monetize it in even your book. You'll the, the, I, the blog. No, the book. Yes. So I can see marketing my book on my blog and including links to, you know, Amazon. Um, but I just, I tried, uh, monetizing it and I just, the, the amount of money I was making wasn't worth it. Mm-hmm. Wasn't worth the, the, um, I just like the clean look. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know that I would monetize it that way. I mean, as far as just ads, I don't right. know that I would do that. I would come up with something different. So for example, what we're doing in Cincinnati now, and it hasn't even started yet, but I'm in conversations with a woman that runs a bloggers group. Mm-hmm. And so what we're going to start doing is, you know, with my clients, my clients are small businesses. They're constantly trying to find ways to get exposure. They're asking me about SEO. Well, you know, how do I get up at top of Google? And some of that is backlinks. So it, we're co- collaborating with these bloggers and we're going to be introducing these bloggers to small business owners. And we're going to start a, uh, a package option where business owners can decide how much exposure they want. And they can say, well, for $100, I'm going to get three links in three blogs. And so then we're going to find the bloggers that make the most sense. And then we're going to go back to those bloggers and say, this, you know, these are the businesses locally that would just like a mention, you know, that would just like a, you know, something out there for SEO purposes and backlinks. And so it's all a very, on a very local level. And we're just going to start partnering businesses with, you know, and, and so that's how they're going to make money. And it's not going to be an ad, you know, it's not going to be a click through ad. Right. It's just going to be link, you know, backlinks basically. So, um, we had a, I was at a PRSA event the other day. PRSA is the public relations society of America. And I'm a member now. I've never been a member before until November. I love it. They're, they're amazing people. They're really fun. A lot of energy. They're very supportive. And that we were at this big event and the PR director for the aquarium was there. And our aquarium is huge, like really big organization, Cincinnati. And she said, um, she was encouraging people. She's like, we reach out to the bloggers a lot because, because they have a following. And right. I mean, that would be an interesting blog for you to say, go to the aquarium, check out the aquarium. You know, you could go to the aquarium and write a blog about it and how it made you feel. And you know, if it was very calming and if it was enjoyable and they would pay you to do that. <laughs> right. Right. So, so I think that's how we're going to try to, it's, I think those are great ideas i'm i don't i've i try after blogger 16 which i attended which is a big um blogging conference um back in 2016 i tried um affiliate some affiliate marketing and influencer marketing mostly influencer marketing um and and i decide i decided again the amount of money i was making doing that wasn't worth it and one of the things is that um and this is, I'm, I'm privileged in that I have a husband who makes enough money. So I don't need the stress of having, it's stress of having to try to make money. I also am on disability. So, um, and, and the stress of even like meeting deadlines or seeking, you know what I mean? It, it triggers symptoms in me. So I prefer to keep my stress at a minimum level. And to to not have to worry about that in terms of making money. I'm good at managing money, which is unusual for somebody with my diagnosis, <laughs> but I'm good at like, um, do, because I used to do an analysis, I like analyzing numbers. So I'm good at managing our money, our savings and stuff. I'm good at spending it and I'm good at managing it. But um, I don't need to make money because of the disability income I, I get. Um, and because when I try to step out of that and try to start making money, it triggers symptoms and I don't want, I want, it's always more important that I be stable. So some people are able to do that. And I just, anytime, um, 
I just, uh, I prefer to just have a stress-free life. My life is just so stressful as it is that, that taking on that extra thing that I don't need to take on, it's just not worth it for me. Um, I'm just like, you know what? I, I, I have enough. That's enough. And another thought just to throw this out would potentially be to, um, if you have a cause, you know, and I know you went to several universities and, and then I don't know if there would be a cause. I'm sure there are, because you said, you know, you appreciate science and research that might be, you know, if you were making a little bit a way to give back to those organizations, you know, to have a cause around it somehow. So, and not that I would, not that I'm saying you should do that, but, um, but if the money isn't necessarily something that is impactful enough in your life, right. It might be interesting if you did have that just to say all of it goes to this cause, you know, to this research and that would be a cool thing to have out there, you know, just something, you know, that, that you value that way. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I am going to, I am going to stop the recording because we okay. might all So, but, um, but it's been so fun. Thank you so much, Kit, for being with me today. And I learned a lot and I took a lot of notes and I so appreciate your time and oh, that you, thank you with me today. So, all right. And we'll stop the recording, but okay. then we'll, we'll hang out. We'll, we'll okay. Be, we won't say bye already.